Good evening, everyone. It is five o'clock. Time for us to begin our our evening worship. For those worshiping with us online, things might be off just a little bit. Uh, we adjusted the camera angle to try to get some of the of the screen beside me here. Uh, Brother Stan's got a lesson that's going to incorporate some PowerPoint slides. So I want to say thank you all for coming uh, coming back this evening. Uh, if this is your first time with us today, thank you for, for being here with us uh, in person. If you're visiting, please fill out a visitor's card and give it to one of the men, and we will make sure we have a record of your attendance. If you have a cell phone, please make sure you turn that to silent. And we will begin our worship with a prayer. Merciful Father in heaven, we humbly approach you again today asking for your forgiveness of our sins, for the times that we stumbled, the times that we failed to put our trust and our faith in you. Father, we pray that you will please help us to be stronger and help us to do what we can to, to please you with our lives. We thank you, Father, so much for the opportunity that we have to to gather here to worship you, the opportunity we have to come before your throne and beg for for forgiveness and for things that we may do that are not in accordance with your will. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for our hope of eternal life. And we pray, Father, that you will please continue to watch over us and, and that you will help us to always be mindful of of what we should do to be pleasing to you. Heavenly Father, we pray that the things said and done here this hour will strengthen us all and that that you will be glorified in our actions. We pray, Father, you will please be with the congregation as we strive to make an impact in this area to, to bring those who are seeking you into the fold. We pray that you will please bless those same efforts uh, as we work with missions around the world. Heavenly Father, we pray now that we will focus fully on worshiping you and doing all that we can to, to live our lives in a pleasing manner. Forgive us for our sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. The first song this evening is going to be number 577. For those online, we're using the Songs of the Church. And we're, number 577, there's a royal banner. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign bear we lift it up today, while its ransom ones we see. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything but law. For the King of Kings, toil and sea, needs the banner of the cross. Over land and sea, wherever men may dwell, make the glorious tidings known. Of the crimson banner, now the story tells, one <coughs> shall claim his own. Marching on, marching on. For Christ counts everything but love. For the King of kings, oil and sing, needs the banner of the cross. When the great commander from the vault of sky sounds the resurrection day, then before the saints and foes shall die, and the saints shall march away. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything. 
everything but love. For the King of Kings, oil and sea, need the banner of the cross. Our next song before the scripture is number 318. 318. And the title of that is Live for Jesus, for those of you online. <clears throat> 318. Live for Jesus, oh my brother, his disciple ever be. Render not to any other what alone the Lord should see. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give. On the cross the world's redeemer gave his life that thou might live. Live for Jesus, wandering sinner, under day. And serve no more of the promise Christ the winner now may be when life is o'er. Give for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give on the cross of Redeemer gave his life that thou might live. Live for Jesus in life morning at the noon tide hour be his. And that he when day is turning and in time we'll have our scripture reading. The song of invitation will be number 714. Good evening. Our scripture reading for tonight is from the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 60 verse 4. Psalm chapter 60 verse 4. You have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. You know, outward signs and symbols are important. I mean... I haven't performed a lot of weddings, but I've performed a few. And in most, they wanted the ring ceremony. They wanted to exchange those rings that were going to be the outward symbol to all who see it. Of the affiliation, the love, the affection, the allegiance that the couple has to one another. A lot of times we wear a pen that shows some sort of affiliation or allegiance. As most of you probably know, I have started teaching a class at the Southwest School of Bible Studies. Just one class involves one day a week. But what did I have to do? I needed to go back and find my SWBSBS pen so I could have it on. Sometimes it's an organization. Sometimes it's a religious organization. Sometimes it's a military organization. But we have these things that identify our affiliation. If we're affiliated with a group and we are proud to be associated with that group, we want other people to know about it. Well, one of the most famous symbols, I'd say throughout history, is that of a flag that of a banner. The flag of our country. We sing to the flag. We sing the star-spangled banner. 
And that is a symbol of this country, a symbol of our allegiance to it. And I hope despite some troubles now that it will continue to be for many, many years, many, many decades to come. In time of war, those kinds of symbols become even more important. Those symbols can be a strong unifying factor. <laughs> the song that was sung to our flag is in the middle of the night, in the middle of the battle. It's a unifying factor. Many times the flag is raised as an assembly point, as a rallying point for the troops. It's put in front of the troops as they march. That way everybody knows where they're going because they're following that symbol of the flag. It really, in many cases, can become an emotionally charged symbol. And in addition to that, what that flag does for us who are affiliated with that flag, it has outside effects also. Many times the symbol of the flag and the unity and the strength it represents can send a message to the opposing forces. Solomon used the expression in Song of Solomon 6 verse 4, as awesome as an army with banners. A flag or a banner is important because it gives unity and strength to those who carry it, and, and it can be a little bit of an intimidating force to others outside who see it. So a banner, a flag is very important. So it should not surprise us that God has given us a flag. God has given us a banner. Our text in Psalm 60 verse 4 tells us, You have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. So it's important for us to know what that banner is. We need to display that banner. You can't display it if you don't know what it is. It's important for us, just like it is a military. In any organization that is fighting for a cause, symbols can be very important. So we ought not to fail to unfurl our God-given banner. Banner. So our foes will know where our allegiance is, where our friends will know where our allegiance is. If we fail to unfold the banner, unfurl the banner, we have given a great advantage to our enemies. So this evening I want us to consider our banner. What is the banner? Who gave us the banner? To whom is the banner given? It becomes a very important question. How do we display the banner? First, what is our banner? Well, what is the visible rallying sign of Christianity? It's Christ himself. Christ is our banner. That's what we keep our eyes on as we're going through this world. That's certainly what we keep our eyes on when we're engaged in any kind of conflict. Our banner is Christ himself. In fact, this was one of the specific prophecies about Christ. Isaiah, who describes so much not only of the events of Christ's life, but describe his demeanor, Isaiah is the one who told us that Christ was going to be our banner. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10, And in that day, Isaiah prophesies, there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Then in verse 12, he will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Root of Jesse is Christ. Isaiah says that Christ is going to be our banner. And the prophecy says that Christ, as that visible banner, will attract the Gentiles. And it also says he'll be a rallying point for the wayward Jews. And indeed, it was the appearance of the Messiah that began the process of unifying the Jews and the Gentiles especially by Jesus' ultimate death by crucifixion, that became a rallying point. You know, Paul says we preach Christ, but that's not all he says. We preach Christ and we preach Christ crucified. There is that rallying point. There is that banner. There is that symbol of unity. There is that emotional symbol that ties us together. Jesus said, John twelve thirty two, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people unto me. And indeed, by his sacrifice, by his crucifixion, he did draw. He did draw at least some of the wayward Jews back to him. And as we read in the scriptures, he, maybe, he's, maybe he drew to him, we would think, as a surprising number of Gentiles. Christ is the banner of the Christian. So that's what the banner is. Now, by whom is the banner given? Well, that's kind of an easy one. It's God that gave the banner to his followers. 
psalmist says, you have given a banner. And who was it gave Christ to us? Now, this is another easy one. It's Christ who gave his son, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Paul tells us that when Christ was sent by the Heavenly Father, that's when he was given. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. He was given on the cross when he was sacrificed for our sins. 1 John 4, 10. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. There's the giving. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And we talk about that, and well, we should. We understand there's two aspects to it. God gave, and there's great love that caused him to give his only forgotten son. But there was great love that Jesus agreed to come and to be a part of that sacrifice. One thing I think we neglect sometimes is we express our thanks for Christ's sacrifice on the cross. I think we also need to remember that the life that he lived, if he had not lived his life for God, every day, every hour, every minute of his life, then he would not have been the appropriate sacrifice for us. So before he could give himself for us, he had to give his life, his entire life, every moment of his life to God. If somebody said to me, Stan, I'll give you two choices. One, you can die for Christ now, or you have to live a perfect life the rest of your life. I think I'd have to take the die now because I just wouldn't have confidence in me to live the perfect life the rest of the life. We need to love and appreciate God, the Father, and the Son. This is love, not that we love God. He loved us and he sent his Son for our sins. So indeed, the banner of Christ that we have was provided by the Heavenly Father. Almost a tricky question here. Now, to whom is the banner given? Our text says in Psalm 60, the banner was given to those who fear God. In every era, God has had a following. He has had those who rejected the principles and the attractions of the world and chose to abide by the principles that God set forth. People in every era have reached the conclusion that Solomon did fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of the whole duty of man. And there's no doubt that when Christ there's no doubt that when Christ came, his gift was intended to be for all people. God showed that principle so clearly to, to Peter at the house of Cornelius. After the things that occurred there, uh, Peter appropriately concluded. In a truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So all men and women today are invited to be a follower of Christ. They're invited to have an affiliation with that banner. But only those who fear God will raise up that banner. The unbelievers will not do it. The disobedient should not do it. What hypocrisy it is to claim an affiliation and an allegiance to Jesus, but really reject him as our Lord by not obeying him. So there is, there is some discernment here. It really is only the fearful, only those who fear God that will raise up the banner in any kind of useful way. Only in the hands of the faithful followers does the unfurling of the banner bring glory to the banner. So we need to lift up the banner. How do we do it? How do we lift up that banner? Well, our, our text says you've given a banner to those who fear you that it may be dis displayed because of the truth. God has given us that banner to display it because of the truth. It is our pursuit of the truth that causes us to have that affiliation with Jesus, have that allegiance to God. It is our pursuit of, the, of his cause that gives us that association with the banner. But how do we display the banner? Well, I guess it can be done a lot of different ways. I'll suggest three to you. One is it can be displayed by word of mouth. That's what Philip did, Acts 8.35. Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning at this scripture, and preached Jesus to him. And we remind ourselves that, that Philip was not some special full-time evangelist. 
He was like those who sit in the pews. And the past few years, you have seen me in the pulpit. But for many, many years before that, I was in the pews. I still think of myself as one of the ones that's in the pews. The ones in the pews need to be willing to spread the word about Jesus. Philip opened his mouth. Philip was not a full-time evangelist. He was one of those who were scattered from Jerusalem, Acts 8, 4, who went everywhere preaching the word. One commentator placed it this way, uh, put it this way. He says, one of the greatest tragedies that has come upon the church today is the tragedy of the closed mouth. We need to be opening our mouth. The average Christian is not vocal enough about that banner, about what that banner means to us. Psalm 107, verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Do we say so? Where do we say so? When do we say so? How do we say so? Too many in the pew, one person expressed it this way, too many in the pews have left the talking to those in the pulpit. You don't want to leave all the talking about Christ to those in the pulpit. And it occurred to me, it's not lost on me, that we have a wonderful opportunity here in a couple of months to talk about Christ as our banner and to talk about the Bible and talk about lessons about the Bible. Hopefully we are starting already planting the seeds in some of those that we know, some of those who know us, about the lectureship. I love the lectureship time of the year. It's a time that I can invite people to come to services without having to invite them to listen to me preach. So <laughs> makes it a little easier for come. There are a lot of good speakers. And you know the history has been that the speakers have been excellent. And the past few years, I've been the guy who reads all the manuscripts. These manuscripts are excellent. I don't know whether you have searched for information in the in the shirts the Denton shirts lectureships and searched for information in other commentaries. What we have put out here is as good as any that's available. Commentaries written only by members of the Lord's Church. And maybe I can offer the plug. This year, the subject is Job, and the lectures this. Presentations will be on Job. But we've also completed that one last book, that one book that's going to contain numbers in Deuteronomy. It's already at the printers. They've said it will be here in October. That's well before November, we hope. So as of this year, the whole series is completed. Starting in 1982 up in Denton, Texas, ending in 2021 in Schertz, Texas, commentary on Every book of the Bible written only by members of the Lord's church. What a treasure. What a treasure that is. But the book of Job, I think it's a great book for inviting other people. Maybe especially after the past couple of years. Maybe we've been kind of set up for this, you know. There are a lot of people who have had unusual difficulties in their lives. And many people. One of the things they know about the Bible is the man Job. The difficulties he suffered. Maybe. Maybe, just maybe, if you ask just right, you could interest some people in coming to listen to those. So, let us not be part of the closed mouth crowd, especially when we have something so good to open our mouth about. Another way we can uh, lift up the banner, not besides word of mouth, is our manner of life. To the Ephesians, Paul said, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. That's interesting, the word calling. It's almost like a vocation. Our Christianity is not something we dabble in on Sunday. Our Christianity is a part of the way we conduct our life. Even more so than the secular jobs that we have, that is our constant way of living our lives. Uh, Paul admonished, oh, okay, there's Ephesians 4.1, Beseech you to walk worthy of the calling to which you were called. Philippians 1.27, only let your manner of life be worthy, be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Faithful Christians, those who live under the constant influence of the gospel, they're going to be different. They're going to be distinctive in their speech. They're going to be distinctive in their habits. They're going to be distinctive in their disposition. Many years ago, it wasn't a preacher, it was an elder who was taught a lesson on the sins of the disposition. And I thought, sins of the disposition? What's all that about? <laughs> the more he talked and the more I learned, the more I decided he's exactly right. 
Many times the distinctiveness of those who are followers of Christ is their disposition. They're kinder, they're gentler, they're more loving, they're more tolerant, they're more forgiving. If we're not doing that, then we're failing to be distinctive. And I tell you, in this time, <laughs> a person who is tolerant and forgiving is going to be pretty distinctive. There is a lot of frustration and impatience in the world. So, we are supposed to be, 2 Corinthians 6.17, we're supposed to be called out, we're supposed to be different. One of the ways that we can be different is by our speech, by our actions, and yea, verily, by our dispositions. So Christ is our banner. We must raise up our banner by the way we live, by the way we talk, by what we say, and maybe especially by what we say about him. To unfurl the banner, we've got to be willing to take it out of the case. If we leave it in the, leave it in the case where people can't see it, then, you know, we, we failed in our task before we even started. We can't keep it hidden. Christ was not ashamed of us. He was not ashamed of us even with all of our sins. How can we be too ashamed of him to lift him up as our banner? Raise him up in our lives to those around us. So we must never be ashamed of the one who was never ashamed of us. I don't know if we ever stop to count the ways, the legitimate reasons he would have been at had to be ashamed of us. We could probably do that inventory. It would probably be a painful and embarrassing inventory, but it would remind us the extent of which he declined to be ashamed of us. We can't be ashamed of him. We've got to be willing to declare him, to raise him up, even if there's a cost to us that's associated with it, even if the cost is great. So, what will be the result of our lifting up our banner? Well, it does good things for us. It does good things for our fellow Christians. And really, it can do great things for those in the world. When we lift up our banner, then our open confession of our faith strengthens us. The person who is not willing to let his association or affiliation or his banner be known, he has endangered himself. Compromise, denial are always a possibility. Sometimes anonymity means that we can be timid about stating our position. That's perhaps what led to Peter's denial of the Lord. He was unwilling to own that allegiance, that association. In many ways, to declare ourselves is to protect ourselves. I remember when I was going to ACU, Abilene Christian University, Abilene Christian College back in the 60s when I went there. There was a big old symbol that had the A and the C and the U in it, and I had it right in the middle. I don't know how we could do that back then. Right in the middle of my rear window. And I tell you, I was conscious of that. Everywhere that I went, every place that I stopped, everything that I did where people could see me being associated with that car, I was very concerned about that. I was very attentive about that. I felt like anybody who saw me, whatever they saw me doing, that affected the reputation, in their eyes at least, of the Lord's Church because of Abilene's association with the Lord's Church. How would it be if all of us had a, a, a banner, a <laughs> big bumper sticker right there that said, you know, I'm a follower of Christ. How much harder would it make it then to be someplace you're not supposed to be? How much harder would it be then to do something you're not supposed to do? What a boost it would be to our determination if we are willing to declare that affiliation. And what I found in life about this and a lot of other things is there are times I'm stronger, there are times that I'm weaker. And if there's a time that I'm stronger, what I try to do is I try to do things that will help me when I'm weak. And if I'm feeling strong and I'm willing to make that affiliation, I'm willing to make that association, I know that when I have one of those weak times, that's going to help me from slipping and sliding away. So we need to make the commitment that puts the banner of Christ on our forehead. Then if we are tempted, we're going to be stronger because we know we must be true to that banner. 
Lifting up the banner will give courage to other Christians. One person expressed it this way, says, One loyal heart helps to keep another heart true. It's important for those who are around us. Think back in your life. How many times have you been strengthened by thinking of an example of somebody you've known in the past? Courage is contagious. And a person's example of courage doesn't end when they die, does it? If you can remember people who have been in situations and they've been courageous, that will stand you in good stead all of your life. But that contagion is possible. We can have that contagious, that courageous, contagious effect on other people only if we are willing to take that banner out and to unfurl it and let people see it. If we unfurl it with pride and confidence and courage, if we'll do that in front of our fellow Christians, we will strengthen them. And finally, an open declaration of our faith will help give to the world what it needs. Sometimes I think we wonder how much of an influence are we really having on the world? Well, we're having the kind of influence that God intended for us to have. He didn't say form an army and go off and conquer the world. Live your life according to the biblical principles. And maybe in days like these, it's a tragic thing for Christians to be reluctant to declare their faith. Sometimes we have people expressing their concerns about the nation. But what the nation needs is, simply put, the nation needs to see our banner. If we've got our banner out, if all of us have our banners out, after a while, some people are going to begin to see those banners. We can show our nation our banner one neighbor at a time. They need, they need to know God's plan for their lives. We have to teach them the plan by letting them see us live the plan. We need to show them the right plan for personal integrity. We need to show them the right plan for personal morality. We need to show them the right plan for family. That was the way God said the Israelites would influence those very worldly Canaanites that were around them. One of my favorite passages, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. We need to take this to heart. Moses writes, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful, that is full of care, to observe them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. You know, those terrible people around us, I don't think they're probably any worse than those Canaanites. If God had the idea that the Israelites, living according to his principles, could actually have an effect on those Canaanites, I think that's sufficient precedent for us to think we can have the same effect on the people around us. They are no worse than those Canaanites. They will learn about God if we hold up our banner so that they will know why we are what we are. You know, we've talked before. You know, you can go out into the world and be a good person, and they'll look at you and say you're a good person. But they're going to credit that to you. They're going to credit that to your parents. They're going to credit that to your family. Unless you make that distinct association with the Lord, with the Lord's church, with the Bible's teachings. Only then are we bringing glory to God, is if we help make that link. We have what they need. They're unlikely to find it unless they see our banner. So, we have a banner. <laughs> We have a flag today, Psalm 60, Isaiah 11. We find that God gives a banner to those who fear and follow him. A banner that must be used in a righteous cause for righteousness sake. And we learn what that banner is. The ultimate banner is Jesus Christ. We have a banner. We must display that banner to strengthen ourselves, to strengthen those around us. Show our banner to the world. They may not read the book, but they can see the movie one scene at a time in our lives. This evening, have you been displaying your banner? 
I know most here have made the commitment to be a follower of the Lord. That's how you pick up the banner. You become a follower of Christ. You believe and you confess and you repent and you're baptized. But I think what we need to do is kind of be more conscious of that banner. You know, God is the great communicator. We think sometimes about the parables of Jesus, but those parables of Jesus are not even the beginning of all of the wonderful image teaching that God gives us in the Bible. One of those images is a flag. One of those images is a banner. Maybe we should think of our lives day by day, hour by hour. Are we holding up the banner? Are we letting it dip? Are we letting it fall? Are we putting it back in the case? Are we hiding it? If we do that, we need to repent of that. We need to be determined to do better than that in the future. So this evening, we all have banners. If we can help one another with their banner, we should do that. If there's some way we can help you with your banner tonight, we would be glad for you to come forward as we sing. Seven fourteen. What will your answer be? Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday your record you'll see. Someday you'll answer the question of why. What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Trembling, you'll fall on your knees. Facing the sentence of life death. What will that sentence be? Will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare. Washed in the blood of the crucified one, he will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Please be seated. Is there anyone in the audience that needs to partake of the Lord's Supper this evening? All right. Let's sing number 167 before the Lord's Supper. Let's sing all three verses and then the chorus of this song. Why did the Savior bark of leave and come to earth below? Where men his grace would not receive because he loved me so. Why did the Savior march away? And why did the nation know? Why teach and boil and bleed and pray? Because he loved me so. Why feel the garden's dreadful rock? Why through his trials go? Why suffer death upon the cross? Because he loved me so. 
Who needs to partake of the Lord's Supper? Oh, did you get the... You got it. Okay, great. In uh, Luke chapter 22, we read of Luke's account of the Lord's Supper, Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. We read in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, the emblems that he set apart, set aside, to represent his death on the cross. And he took bread and gave thanks and break and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The bread represents his body. The fruit of the vine rep represents the blood that he shed on the cross. As we partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week, we remember his death. And this is something that some in the world would say, doesn't that get old and boring and, and meaningless after a while? Only if you don't respect the Word of God. But if you respect God and His Word, and if you love Christ for what He did for us, this will never get old. This will be, this is a remembrance of His death and a reminder to ourselves that His precious blood, the Son of God, cleanses us of our sins. And so as we partake of the Lord's Supper, let's remember these things. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in Heaven, thank You so very much for what Jesus did for us. Father, help us to never forget, never take for granted the great thing that He did to take the sins of the world upon Himself, and bury them, and with His blood, He cleanses us of our sins. We thank Thee, Father, for this bread that represents the body that He gave as the sacrifice on our behalf. Thank You very, much. thank You so much, Heavenly Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's also give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven. Thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that Jesus shed before he, he was nailed to the cross and while he was on the cross. The blood that he shed, Father, was his precious blood. That blood is what was necessary to wash away our sins. We thank the Heavenly Father for his great, mighty, and wonderful sacrifice so that we, through him, might have the hope of eternal life. Thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, good evening once again. If anyone had planned on uh, making a contribution, to, uh, there will be a plate on the table in the foyer. Moving on to our announcements. As we mentioned this morning, uh, uh, Garl was fighting a kidney stone. It looks like he showed that kidney stone to his boss. He's here with us tonight, so glad to have you back. All right. Ralph and Jennifer Wernley were here with us this morning. Um, his sister is in, in the area down here, Alva Lott, and, and she is approaching the end of her days um, with a serious heart condition, so they're down here spending time with her. And also uh, Linda Planchard's granddaughter, Talina, um, it was announced that she's got advanced cervical cancer. Uh, and she's, she's 37, has three kids. She's trying homeopathic treatment, uh, and she needs our prayers. Also, uh, Linda came forward and asked uh, that she would have, uh, asked for our prayers, a, a strength for her to be a good example for them. We have uh, the Monday night uh, ladies class 
on Zoom that will meet tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So please uh, participate in that if you're able. And also on September 14th at 10 a.m., the ladies, uh, the Tuesday ladies class will resume. So that would uh, two good opportunities for Bible studies there. Uh, there's a sign-up list on the Youth Bulletin Board for volunteers to host youth events in the coming months. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, if you, uh, if, even if you don't have children uh, in the youth group, it uh, would be uh, uh, greatly appreciated if you could sign up and host the event. And uh, Scott will make sure that uh, there's somebody arranged to do the, the devotional. Just appreciate the congregation reaching out and, and uh, showing support for the youth group. We're also collecting supplies for the uh, Hurricane Ida relief effort through a, uh, a, a church-affiliated group called Christian Disaster Relief. Um, they are uh, organizing supplies uh, and uh, gift cards, money, different things like that uh, to help uh, with the devastation that, that took place in, in Louisiana when the, the hurricane rolled through here not too long ago. So the, uh, there are two bins underneath the, uh, basically where the youth bulletin board is outside the, the secretary's office. So put your supplies in there or if you'd uh, rather uh, give uh, the money to, uh, to, to the congregation, uh, make sure that uh, just if it's a check, Put the disaster relief uh, info in the memo and uh, give it to, to in your in the contribution plate or directly to Kim here tonight, uh, and we'll make sure it gets to the right place. The next men's breakfast will be on October 9th at uh, 8 a.m. at Garcia's. So please make sure you have that on your calendar, and this will be one that's open up to everybody, uh, all the men who are who would like to come and participate. We also uh, made the announcement this morning that the, as the lectureship is ra rapidly approaching, the need for housing is uh, is there. We're modifying the forms to say if you cannot host somebody uh, in your house due to COVID uh, or, or other concerns uh, with with that, but you would like to still help out, um, there's an opportunity to maybe uh, to uh, provide some funds that would allow speakers to be put up in a hotel so please still grab one of those sheets and and fill that out and put what you're able to do to support on that sheet you know we're trying to do that as, as Stan is organizing both who's coming and needs housing requests and who's available or who will be able to provide support here locally so we're trying to get all that organized within the next few weeks so we can have a better picture of what's going on and also, as I mentioned uh, this, this morning, uh, the names that were presented to to the elders for consideration for future elders uh, were, were Stan Crowley, uh, uh, Stan Stockton, and Garl Latham. So now uh, this is the uh, the time that those names are back over to you to 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 notify them if you have a scriptural concern about their serving as elder. We ask that you go to them first. And if you can't resolve the issue, then bring the issue to, to either me or Michael, and we will have uh, further discussions on that. So if there are no scriptural objections uh, that are substantiated or, or, or uh, that we have to consider and, and uh, pretty much uh, eliminate some way from, from that consideration, um, we, we will move forward in, in accordance with the scriptures. But if there's no uh, scriptural objections, we will install them in on the 26th of September. So those are the announcements that we have for this evening. So let's be standing and we'll have our closing prayer after the closing song. Our closing song is number 479. For those online, the title is Sowing the Seed of the Kingdom. <clears throat> and after the singing of the song, we'll have our closing prayer by Brother Steve Springer. <clears throat> Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning, bright and fair? 
are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday glare? For the harvest time is coming on, and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheep be many? Will you garner many? The gathering at the harvest home. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the still and solemn night? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, for a harvest pure and wide? For the